We've talked about some of the intuition of uh, support vector regression, and it's time to play a little bit with the code. In Scikit-Learn, there are a variety of classes that you can access. The book talks about both of these, uh, linear SVR and uh, SVR. SVR, of course, is the more general version where you can uh, ask for a variety of different kinds of kernels. So let's transition to Jupyter. So this skeleton is uh, in the Git repository. Uh, what I've added here is a little bit of uh, extra support for doing 3D plotting. So we'll look at that here in a minute. So I've just brought all of those pieces in. Uh, this function, this cell implements a function that does uh, 3D plotting for us. It takes as input our input features and either our true output or our predicted output, either one is fine. It's assuming that we have just uh, two input features. And what it does is it generates a surface plot of the predicted value as a function of the, the two input features. And then I'm also throwing in there a, uh, a particular color map to make it a little bit easier to stare at. So let's go ahead and uh, bring that into the environment. And then the data set uh, I've included within the Git repository, it's svrdata.pickle. And in here, I'm getting uh, pulling in both the set of features and the, the values to be predicting. All right, and so let's go ahead and visualize. Let's go ahead and visualize what, uh, what the data looks like. So we're making use of our uh, function here. So this is, uh, this is something that I just created uh, artificially. It's a, a product of two different cosines. Uh, the, the two uh, horizontal axes here correspond to our two features, and Z here uh, corresponds to the, uh, the value that we're supposed to be predicting. So first up, let's give our linear version of uh, SVR a chance and see how well that works out. So this, this takes a variety of different uh, parameters. I'm just using a default uh, parameter for this. And then I'm gonna go ahead and use cross val predict again. And that takes as input our model, our inputs and outputs. And we're gonna do cross validation 10 and I'm gonna go ahead and set n jobs to five here. The idea is that I can be running up to five uh, parallel threads at once in order to, in order to compute the cross-validation. Uh, for those of you who are using our server, you only have one processor available, so I, I believe you will see uh, uh, errors thrown if you try to use n jobs of anything other than one. But execution, nonetheless, is pretty straightforward. So let's go ahead and look at those, the, the function that we get out of this. And there we go. So, so this isn't a big surprise. We're using an, a linear model that, that's underlying this, this whole thing. And, and so the function that we, the, the surface that we get can really be nothing but uh, linear. So it does its best to match the true data but uh, it certainly falls very short of what we're, where we need to be. So that, that takes us to uh, the next thing to try, which is our polynomial kernel here. And from here, I'm, I'm going to switch over to the SVR class, where we can specify interesting kernels. And again, we have this C parameter which is our regularization parameter. And this is polynomial, so we can specify our degree. I'm gonna start with degree two. And for gamma, I, I've, I've, ahead of time, I've played with this a little bit. Uh, one can certainly set auto here, uh, but as you get higher degrees, it, the computation time tends to go way up. So I'm gonna go ahead and set gamma at a pretty small of uh, 
a small value of 0.1. So there's our model, and now we can do our cross val predict. And that actually executed relatively quickly. And what shape do we end up with? Uh, so there we go. So that, that shape certainly is something different than the linear function. It's an, actually, we had essentially a constant function before. It, it is sort of getting the trend of this, this corner here being a little bit higher, but uh, the very tip here in the original function actually was quite low. Let me flip back over to the original data to get a sense of uh, where we should be here. So it really extends uh, between plus minus one and this very tip here should be sitting at zero. In fact, both of these and, and this one here should be sitting at zero, whereas this one is high up. Um, we're really not getting uh, much of anything out of our polynomial kernel. If you, if you set gamma to auto, I think it even doesn't perform even as well as this. So let's give that a try. Okay, so, so we still, still end up with this uh, shape here. Uh, we can try playing with our regularization parameter, so try to reduce those errors. And actually, now it's going to take a little bit longer to compute this. Okay, it, it finished doing this in about five or 10 seconds with the five jobs running. Uh, we still end up with a function that's essentially doing the, the same thing. Uh, if I set this to 100, I'm gonna put gamma down to 0.1 here so that we're not waiting too long for it. So this will still take a, a few seconds to compute this, but but we end up with essentially the same function as we did before. Okay, so, so for a variety of regularization parameters walking all the way from a very flat function to one that really wants to uh, meet the data, it, this is not working all that well. Um, let's try pushing our degree up to uh, three here and see if that helps. So that actually did not work quite as well as before. Let's switch degree back to two just to do a visual comparison. So with, with the degree two, um, the tip here and the tip on the other side are uh, bending down a little bit, but, but when we flip to degree three, uh, it was wanting to be more flat. So just for fun, let's flip up to degree four. Yeah, so, so here it's definitely trying to be flat. The other side is, is certainly bending down some. Let's try and match our data a little bit better. So I just moved C up to 10. So, so in our playing around, we're making small changes to the function that we've learned, but we're not really accomplishing very much. Uh, let me try, we can take this up to degree eight, just for fun. So this is uh, still running. I did want to show you uh, a utility in the background here. Um, uh, there is a command in Unix called top, and it will tell you what the top processes are that are running, so I'm just executing this in one of the shells. And you can see, I, I set n jobs to five, and you can see that I have five uh, Python jobs running at once. These are most likely implemented as just independent threads all operating in within one single process. Um, but cross-validation cross naturally is, is a parallelizable type of uh, an operation because it's, it's easy to have one thread take care of one model, another thread take care of the next model, uh, et cetera. 
And then at the very end of them learning the models and uh, computing performance or predictions for the validation folds, uh, one, once each thread is done doing that, then they just need to be combined together uh, in, as the final, for the final output. Okay, but we're still waiting here uh, a couple minutes later. All right, that took about uh, six minutes running in parallel, and here's uh, what we ended up with. You can, you can see that it actually did manage to get some amount of that shape, that hump uh, off to this uh, area here. And in fact, this very corner here, it, it's not all the way down, but it's, it's uh, certainly a lot lower than the, the peak of, our, of, of the hump. So, so we're better, doing a better job of approximating the function, but we're still quite a ways away. So let's go ahead and turn to our uh, Gaussian or our RBF uh, type kernel. And that is RBF specified there in the, the parameter. I'm gonna go ahead and set C equal to one and gamma, I'll just go ahead and let it pick auto. And let's do our cross val predict. And one thing, uh, hopefully you notice there, is it came back really fast. So that's a lot more uh, satisfying than the polynomial kernel. So let's look at the function that we learned. So there we go. Uh, we've actually done a, quite a good job of approximating our original function. It's not coming up quite as high as our original function. Let me pan back out to, to it. So it's just a tiny bit higher uh, on the, in the Z scale there. Uh, but it's certainly a, a reasonable approximation. It's certainly a lot closer than we were with the uh, with, with the other kernels. So let's let's go ahead and set let's increase C by a factor of ten. See if that helps us at all. And again, that came back really quickly. That did not really change the the fundamental shape of the the function all that much. I'll try one more time up to a C of 100. And that's, that didn't really change. So, so we're pretty satisfied that this is about what the RBF uh, kernel can do for us. So, so again, fundamentally, what the RBF kernels are really about is, is about looking at samples that are nearby a query sample and using that information to make uh, a determination, make a prediction about uh, what the output should actually uh, be for that new sample that we're querying. The, whereas with the other kernels, the linear kernel or the polynomial kernel, they're trying to build more global uh, lines or curves uh, in, in multi-dimensional space that potentially could extrapolate as well. And since we have such a, a very strange function here from either of those perspectives, uh, they don't capture this the, the function very well, whereas the Gaussian kernels do quite well. However, if you try to ask your Gaussian kernel to try to extrapolate uh, beyond this domain that we're training in, it's it's not going to do uh, all that well. It'll it'll probably just give you a pretty flat answer uh, if you go out from the edges of of this function. One can use support vector regression for our brain machine interface data, and in fact, we've we've done some of that work. I had a student who, who did uh, a master's thesis on this subject. The reality is we can squeak out a little bit better performance with the brain machine interface problem with support vector regression, but, and, and this is relative to say ridge regression, but, what, but we end up paying a very large computational cost. And, and this comes from the fact that our training set sizes are starting to get beyond what the support vector machine capabilities really, really uh, are. So, so when you're choosing to use support vector machines, remember the, the, the thing to look at is, well, first off, they're, they're bringing to the table this ability to, to specify very interesting and complex functions, but they can only manage uh, so many training set points. And beyond a certain point, you end up having uh, to do, in the case of support vector regression, you end up having to do very large matrix inversions, which start to take a lot of computation time. 
So, so complicated functions, but small training sets is, is where the support vector machine things uh, tend to exceed. All right, so that, that finishes up uh, this module. And next up, we start moving on to decision trees.